On October 5th, 2001, the stands in San Francisco were packed with Giants fans waiting to witness history. Barry Bonds had tied Mark McGuire's record the night before. But when Bonds came to the plate in the bottom of the first, ESPN was still airing a Cardinals-Astros game that had run long. And it had to flip the feed to the West Coast. We cut away from Mark McGuire batting to see Barry Bonds batting. How the times change in a hurry. That's right. McGuire was batting at the same time as Bonds. And the broadcast faded to black on the home run king in the final moments he could claim his title. When McGuire broke the record in 98, McGuire said it, this is a record that is going to stand for a really long time. That's Howard Bryant, a journalist who covered Bond's career extensively. And then comes Barry less than three years later. As Bonds rounded the bases, no one from the opposing team congratulated him or even patted him on the butt as he passed. Applause echoed through the ballpark, then died down, and that was that. You see him saying, all right, let's play now. And I, I think that's admirable of Barry Bonds to say, let's go, because the important thing again is the pennant race. Excuse me? The pennant race? The world feels flipped on its head compared with how everyone carried on in 1998. But that was the script. Congratulations to Barry Bonds, and let's move on. Let's get you back to St. Louis, Bob Carpenter, and Oral Hershiser. After the game, Bonds gave a speech to the crowd in San Francisco. It was subdued. We've come a long way. We've had our ups and downs. This time around, the commissioner didn't hold a press conference or hand out a trophy. He wasn't even there. And McGuire had gotten a call from the president to congratulate him. Bond's phone never rang. There was one constant, though, the Today Show. Soon after Bonds broke the record, it aired Bob Costas' interview with the slugger. But the tone was very different from his conversation in 98 with McGuire. Why do you think, even though obviously what you did this year was a great achievement, that it didn't seem to capture the public's imagination to the same extent as the home run race in 98 did? Well, because... 37 years is 37 years. Um, What those two guys were doing was remarkable. And when you have that long of a span of something, it it becomes bigger and broader and it becomes put on a pedestal. And what they did is they broke through a glass of invincibility. And then there wasn't enough time between 98 and now. They were chasing ghosts. You were chasing a contemporary who's still playing. Costas blamed the shadow of 98. But it was more than that. Fans and players were bored with this new version of baseball. Excess had broken the spell of the home run. The magic ran out. Plus, Bonds wasn't the type of player Major League Baseball wanted to promote. Where McGuire had been billed as the model ball player, Bonds was brash and totally unconcerned with what anyone thought of him. Barry Bonds has never been a darling of the media, not the darling of baseball. Barry Bonds has never been a darling of anything. He was also a black man in a whitewashed sport. And fans held him to a different standard. Think about it. Both McGuire and Bonds looked as if they were taking steroids when they broke the record. But only with Bonds were people willing to see that possibility, to let it ruin the moment. The public was like, okay, we're done celebrating. Were they done celebrating because it was Bonds? Were they done celebrating because he was black? Were they done celebrating because this is ridiculous? Yeah, it was probably all the above. And remember, this was October 5th, 2001, just a few weeks after 9-11, when America was confused and vulnerable and spinning out of control. Our world had suddenly become too complicated, and we were desperate for things to be simple again. One place we looked for solace was baseball. But even there, we knew something wasn't right. And so we did whatever we could to catch whoever was ruining America's pastime and get back to normal. But what if normal was too far gone? And what if we'd all focused a bit less on finding the villain and more on teasing out the truth? I'm Joan Neeson, and this is Crushed. Hi, everyone. It's Joan. A quick favor. 
we're conducting an audience survey, and we'd be really grateful if you could take a few minutes and answer some questions about Crushed. Please visit survey.prx.org slash crushed to take the survey. Thanks. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting you in the center of the action with endless ways to make it rain. From live betting to betting on your favorite players, they do it all. Check out the app every day this week to cash in on their daily odds boost. And now for a limited time, DraftKings Sportsbook is giving all new players a deposit bonus up to $1,000 when signing up using promo code CRUSHED. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only, restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Crushed is brought to you by Progressive one of the country's leading providers of auto insurance. With Progressive's Name Your Price tool, you say what kind of coverage you're looking for and how much you want to pay, and Progressive will help you find options that fit within your budget. Use the Name Your Price tool and start an online quote today at Progressive.com. Price and coverage match limited by state law. In the summer of 2001, Jeff Nowitzki was glued to his television. A lifelong fan of Bay Area sports, he couldn't believe what he was seeing from Barry Bonds. He was baseball royalty, the son of a Giants legend, the godson of Hall of Famer Willie Mays. He'd been the best player in baseball for more than a decade, ever since he was a speedy, lithe, five-tool player who could do anything, everything. But over the past few years, Bonds had remade his game and his body to become a home run machine. So Nowitzki wedged himself into the packed stands in San Francisco anytime he could score a ticket. He kept showing up for games, standing with the crowd to cheer Bonds, hoping for a new home run king. But the next year, things became complicated. You see, Nowitzki was an IRS special agent, and in 2002, he got a tip about the case that would make his career. My father's really good friend, the high school track and field coach in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he actually just, you know, a casual conversation, started talking about this place in Burlingame, California called Balco Laboratories. Balco. It stood for the Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative, and it claimed to be a supplement company based in a nondescript office park near the San Francisco airport. What he was hearing is some very high-profile athletes were going there and getting what he knew to be designer-type steroids. This is where we are now. We've moved past Andristine Dione, past testosterone, to mad scientist stuff. These drugs were undetectable because tests don't just flag any and all steroids. They have to be looking for a specific hormone or compound. And if a steroid is developed in secret, like these were, then it isn't on any lists, and there's no way to test for it. And if Balco was an illegal steroid ring, it was more than likely ducking its taxes, which meant Nowitzki had the leeway to investigate. He was immediately intrigued. You see, he's the son of a college basketball coach, had been a star high jumper in high school, and played Division I college hoops. He loves sports. I don't have all good qualities, but the ones that I do have that are good, I can trace back to lessons I learned growing up playing sports. Nowitzki got to work. His first order of business was to figure out what exactly was going on at that out-of-the-way office park. So he defaulted to a tried-and-true tactic, what any good agent would do to kickstart this kind of investigation. Dumpster diving. Nowitzki began to keep watch on the Balco building and to show up late on Mondays the night before trash day. So I'd wait till sometimes midnight, one in the morning, so that everyone from the business park had gone home, pull my car into the area where the trash was, and then quickly transfer it from the trash bin to my car, and then take off out of there. I'd usually go find some lighting nearby so that I could then examine it. He did this every week for a year. This sounds disgusting. But to Nowitzki, it was some of the easiest dumpster diving of his career. I've had some nightmare garbage runs where People were suspecting that their trash was being looked for and they were putting dead animals in their trash. I mean, so you can imagine late at night, you're cold. It's already a little bit scary. You're looking into this dark bin and you start pulling out dead animals. Um, (laughs) That can have an impact on you. So comparatively in my trash examination career, this is one of the, the easier ones. You know, I did the trash runs on Monday night. By Tuesday morning, I started looking forward to the next Monday night. Like, where am I gonna find next week? I was finding evidence that just was blowing my mind. 
I was finding discarded performance enhancing drug wrappers, notes from athletes ordering their next cycle of drugs, email addresses that were being used, bank account information. He found notes from one of Balco's main chemists, the mastermind behind all these undetectable steroids, a guy by the name of Patrick Arnold. Arnold had made his reputation as the first person in the U.S. to manufacture and mass-produce Andro, those pills Steve Wilstein found in Mark McGuire's locker. This was all connected. These new drugs and the drugs that had been seeping into baseball for years. Sure, Balco was working with athletes from a variety of sports. Football, track and field, you name it. But Nowitzki's case zeroed in on America's pastime. Once we started conducting surveillance on it, we started to see some very, very high-profile customers coming in and out of Balco, including Barry Bonds. Now, as far as Bonds was concerned, this wasn't a huge surprise. Balco's front was that it was a supplement company, and Bonds was open about the fact that he used its products. So as opposed to paying Balco, he basically did promotional material for them, saying, hey, it's these supplements that I'm using. There was no paper trail linking Bonds to a steroid purchase. But that was fine. Nowitzki was fairly certain the slugger was using, thanks to what he'd found in the trash. He also suspected Bonds and other Giants players were getting their steroids from Bonds' personal trainer, a guy named Greg Anderson. He would turn out to be the key to this whole case. And Anderson worked with Balco in some capacity. We saw him show up at Balco, step inside for a matter of minutes, come out with something, and then get into his car— And I surveilled it up to the Giants ballpark. He uh, parked in the player's parking lot, went inside the park for five or ten minutes, and then drove off. So in terms of putting pieces to the puzzle together, it surely appeared that Balco had Major League Baseball clients. Inside the Giants clubhouse, Stan Conti, the team trainer we met in episode two, started to notice that something was up. So a player came in, and we did our routine blood test. He says, well, I'm in the middle of a cycle. I said, cycle? I said, you're doing roids. I had to be hit over the head multiple times to go, oh, shit, that's really what's going on. He also noticed Anderson. He was a really big, huge muscle man guy with tons of tattoos. He was everywhere, by Bond's side in the clubhouse, the weight room, as he broke the home run record. Conti suspected Bond's trainer was a drug dealer, and he went to the general manager with his concerns. I had told Brian Sabian that we had a drug dealer in the clubhouse. And he said, do you know any DEA agents? Well, I did, actually. <laughs> I did. One of my ex-patients of mine years ago, he said, well, call them and see if Anderson is under surveillance or are they looking at it. That agent told Conti nothing was going on. Because at that point, the investigation was in the hands of the IRS. But when Nowitzki had enough evidence to act, he got a search warrant and looped in a local narcotics task force, the Food and Drug Administration, and the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. This was now much bigger than taxes. An internal revenue service raid at the headquarters of Balco, just south of San Francisco. All of a sudden, SWAT teams came in. It was, it was like out of the movies. That was in September of 2003. And at first, it didn't turn many heads. The Balco raid was a local news story and little more. Until the federal government convened a grand jury. It called star athletes who'd been linked to Balco to testify about whatever the raid had turned up. American sports were headed to court. Sometime role models like Yankee slugger Jason Giambi, home run record holder Barry Bonds, or linebacker Bill Romanowski, and dozens of other athletes have all been called before a federal grand jury to talk about the nutritional help they've gotten from Balco Labs. To get the athletes to cooperate, the government offered them immunity. That way, they could tell the truth without any threat of legal trouble. In traditional drug investigations, you're not going after the end user. Typically, what you're trying to do is, you know, flip them, try to figure out who's the one selling. This was the government's strategy for clamping down on steroids in sports, to cut off supply. And Nowitzki didn't object. But still... Something felt off to him. What these athletes were doing was perpetuating a fraud on their sports. They were getting millions and millions of dollars from it. Notwithstanding that, we still said, no, this deserves, you know, treatment of a typical drug investigation. As long as, you know, these athletes are truthful to us, we're going to consider them just witnesses. 
As soon as word got out that athletes were set to testify, journalists began to stake out the federal courthouse in San Francisco, taking notes and recording footage. Lance Williams, an investigative reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle, was one of them. The grand jury, after it convened, subpoenaed some 35 great athletes, some of the greatest athletes of the era, and every last one of them had to walk into the federal building in San Francisco and take the elevator upstairs and a couple of the athletes, I remember, gave the finger to the camera people, and one guy wore a jacket over his head, I recall. Bonds testified. So did Giambi, a former MVP, and gold medal-winning track star Marion Jones. The list went on, and the public clamored to know what was happening behind closed doors. This, the scene, the cameras, the live shots beamed across the United States, it was exactly what Nowitzki had hoped for when he took the case. Your job as a federal agent is to find those real high-profile cases, specifically that the media is going to be excited about and cover, and then get the word out that the government's, you know, enforcing these laws or investigating. This would be a great case that would get significant impact and, and positively affect voluntary compliance with laws. That sounds like law enforcement jargon, but it's not. It's actually important. What Nowitzki is saying is that a case like Balco, one that reaches so many eyes and ears, can shift the national conversation. It might be a deterrent, might make drug dealers afraid the government was coming for them next. It also could make athletes leery to use steroids or open fans' eyes to how pervasive this stuff was in sports. So the feds needed the press. They just miscalculated how to handle that relationship. You see, for all the reporting done from the courthouse, there was no way for any of the media there to know what the athletes had said. The government held their testimony under wraps. Then... Four people were charged with crimes related to Balco's distribution of illegal steroids. The lab's founder was one. Greg Anderson, the trainer, was another. But the athletes didn't get in any kind of legal trouble, and their names were redacted from the indictments. They went out of their way, the government did, to protect the public from learning the only information anybody really cared about was what the sports stars had done. So our reporting job after that, Mark and me, was to try to fill in the blanks and figure out who the athletes were and what they had done. Williams and his reporting partner at The Chronicle, Mark Fanaruwada, worked source after source. They needed to find someone who would tell them what had happened behind closed doors. But it was a big ask. Because the grand jury testimony was sealed, it was illegal for anyone with access to share it. But eventually, one source delivered and anonymously leaked the testimony. There were pages and pages of sealed documents implicating dozens of athletes. Jones, Giambi, and there was even more dirt on Bonds. Enough to confirm without a doubt that he'd received steroids from Balco. Bonds has repeatedly denied using steroids, but a report in the San Francisco Chronicle today drew him ever closer to a scandal, embarrassing the sport to say the least. Except Major League Baseball never seemed particularly ashamed. Or even as if it had noticed what was going on. Bonds was never suspended or forced to answer to any of those accusations. And our IRS agent, Jeff Nowitzki, kept showing up to watch him play. Through it all, through the mountains of trash and hours spent bored in his car, staring at the Balco lab, Nowitzki remained a Giants fan. And as he came closer and closer to cracking the case, the sheer enormity of what he was undertaking began to wear on him. The most hallowed record in sports just goes down. And now all of a sudden I have the answers to how that was achieved and how that happened. You know, there were times during that investigation where I'd go to a game and here I am sitting in the crowd with everybody else and Barry goes yard and I'm standing up and cheering and then sitting down and thinking, man, this is kind of like, this is weird that you're still a fan and cheering yet you know what's going on. It was impossible to turn off the part of his brain that had been programmed his entire life to pull for the Giants. Of course it was. This stuff isn't rational. And Nowitzki knew that when news of his investigation broke, fans would be defensive, angry. As irrational as he was when he stood and cheered the man, he was in the process of taking down. For a period of a year and a half, like I'd go to these games, even just walking through the street, looking at people's faces in my head thinking, wait till you find out, you know, what the truth is here. Like the people are gonna be freaking out and they, they were, you know, when it came out. The Chronicle reported Bonds had denied using steroids in front of the grand jury, under oath. 
but it also reported on the evidence Novitsky had turned up, the paper trail that indicated Bonds had in fact been juicing for years. So either Bonds was lying or someone else was. And Giants fans, by and large, remained loyal. They believed their favorite player. They said Novitsky had a vendetta. They said Fanaru Wada and Williams did too. They said their story was bogus. They were making it up. Sound familiar? I remember I was going to meet my son at the Oakland Coliseum, and I was writing over on BART. That's a public transit system in the Bay Area. And uh, Mark and I had been on some sports talk TV show the previous day, and there's this guy looking at me. (laughs) And he had seen me on TV, and he was a big Giants fan. And so as I was getting up to leave the train, he started yelling at me. He said, it's personal with you and Bonds, isn't it? And he's following me. He's yelling, Barry's not going down. You going down. Novitsky was also targeted for his role in bringing the truth to light. Critics said he'd overstepped his bounds, was overzealous in taking these athletes down. As a federal agent, you're used to working behind the shield. Pretty early on, we went public with the indictment of the Balco kind of core players. And then my search warrant was unsealed. Then all of a sudden, it was stories not on the IRS investigating, but Jeff Novitsky, this former athlete, investigating. Remember, Novitsky had been a D1 college basketball player. And the defense teams jumped all over this and started to spin that narrative. Hey, Jeff is a former athlete, failed athlete, didn't you know, get to where he wanted to get to. And he's basically just jealous of all the success. And this is his way of getting back. He even got death threats. Things like someone should go put a bullet in Novitsky's head. I, I just didn't know, you know at what point somebody could try to come after me. For a while, the FBI followed him to make sure he was safe. But I carried my gun with me everywhere I went. I I wouldn't carry it openly, but I had either a little ankle holster or like a little fanny pack that the gun would be in. So kind of scary to think about it, but I coached all my girls. So I'm coaching, you know, soccer, softball, volleyball. And you always thinking them through scenarios. Hey, if someone attacks me here and I'm coaching all these kids, what do I do? You'd think that this case would have made everyone irate at the athletes who cheated. But instead, fans were angry at the IRS agent, and the government went after the journalists who'd exposed the truth. The Department of Justice threatened Fanaru Wada and Williams, demanding they give up their source. Here's Williams again. Once they lock in on you, they treat you like you set off a bomb under a police station. I mean, they go really hard, you know, so that's what we're up against. Williams and Fanaru Wada were not about to comply. Yes, what their source had done was illegal, but they'd promised anonymity. They wouldn't go back on that. And a federal judge sentenced them on two counts of contempt of court. We were sentenced to 18 months, and then the prosecutors said, when you're done, we're going to convene a new grand jury and call you in front of that, and if you won't talk again, you'll do another 18 months. So it was like, oh, man, that's starting to add up. Williams and Venaru Wada filed an appeal and waited. Meanwhile, Balco's founder and Greg Anderson pled guilty. So the case never went to trial. Then the Justice Department identified the Chronicle's source without the reporter's cooperation. And it was just about the last person anyone would have expected. Troy Ellerman, the lawyer who'd represented the Balco defendants. He was incensed by the fact that prosecutors seemed to be covering for star athletes. Leaking was his act of rebellion, and he was sentenced to 30 months in prison more than twice as much time as any of the dealers or distributors. And the athletes, the players who'd been the faces of their sports, who in some cases still were. Major League Baseball did nothing. The Giants did nothing. Nobody did anything. It was almost like the story had never been written. Commissioner Seelig, despite his professing a profound interest in cleaning up the game, his main initial reaction to the indictments in the Balco case was to issue a gag order. Nobody in baseball was supposed to talk about Balco. And when Reggie Jackson, who at the time was uh, had some kind of capacity with the New York Yankees, says, well, of course they were juicing. How else do you think the guy's hitting 70-plus homers? Words of that effect. He got yelled at by the commissioner. All in all, the Balco case lasted about five years, from Novitsky's first trip to the trash in 2002 until the day Ellerman was sentenced in 2007. Over that time, Major League Baseball's official stance on steroid testing, at least on paper, totally changed. 
In 2003, MLB began to test major leaguers for steroid use, but the tests were anonymous. The plan was to keep tabs over the course of the season, and if more than 5% of players tested positive, the league could then impose real testing, with punishments and suspensions and names attached. MLB announced after the season that between 5 and 7% of guys had been dinged. It's unclear why the league couldn't just give a precise number, but really nothing about the way baseball handled any of this made sense. And whether it was because of a shoddy testing program or because Balco's stuff was still too good to detect, Bonds never once failed an MLB steroid test. And then, in 2007, he broke Henry Aaron's career home run record. The only other player in history to hold both the single season and career records was Babe Ruth himself. Bonds was an elite company. These new revelations are raising an issue for fans, too. Do they want fair play or just more home runs? The Balco case did begin to turn public sentiment against steroids in baseball. But it didn't clean up the sport. And if what we wanted was certainty, a villain, someone to blame, Balco was too messy for that. We couldn't decide who the bad guy was. The steroid dealers, the journalists, the IRS agent who dug the truth out of the trash. For things to really change, we needed something clearer. We needed the players themselves to tell us about how and why and what went on behind clubhouse doors. Stay with us. I have a question for you. How are you feeling these days? Maybe a little bummed or a bit off? I get it. And it could be a sign you should talk to somebody. Crushed is supported by BetterHelp, offering professional therapy done securely online. Fill out a questionnaire to help BetterHelp assess your needs and match you with your licensed therapist in under 48 hours. And schedule weekly video, phone, or live chat appointments. It's more convenient and more affordable than in-person therapy. Listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash crushed. That's betterhelp.com slash crushed. Odoo is a suite of business apps, but what does that really mean? You're on your computer, maybe in your PJs, maybe not. You have a tab open with a dashboard of applications, one for every department in your company. There's manufacturing, accounting, website, purchase, and more. You click on the CRM app and reach out to new opportunities. Then you click on the inventory app to make sure your stock levels are good before clicking on the sales app to send a quote to a customer. How many tabs do you have open? Just one. Odoo makes things simple. Go to odoo.com slash sports to start a free trial. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash sports. Let's rewind a few years. Back to 2001 when Bonds broke McGuire's record. In clubhouses across baseball, lines were being drawn. I kept hearing like, oh, everybody knew, everybody was doing it, and it was out in the open. It was, you know, like one big steroid party in the clubhouse. I was like, no, it wasn't. That's Royce Clayton, the former Cardinals shortstop who played with McGuire. We heard from him in episode two. And even though Clayton never used anabolic steroids, he has very strong opinions about guys who did. These dudes are cowards. You know, people that are doing something that's not right, they do it in darkness and they hide and they're embarrassed about it. And that's the way it was. Yes, a lot of guys took steroids. But there were also a lot of guys who didn't. We'll never know exactly how many. But there were certainly clean players on every roster. And by the early 2000s, they were fed up. It used to be a big deal. A guy scores 100 runs, steals 30 bases, hits 300, hits five or six home runs, is a good player. That guy is sucked after steroids. The bar had been raised so high, and it became, you know, how big you are, how strong you are, and how far you can hit the baseball, and that's all that mattered. I had multiple players coming up to me and basically complaining that the game was now unfair. That's Tom Verducci, a longtime baseball writer at Sports Illustrated. It had reached the tipping point where guys felt like they had to make a choice to either play the game cleanly, not risk their health, not violate any kind of moral codes that they had, or scrap all that and just kind of keep up with the Joneses. At that point, in 2001, not a single MLB player had publicly copped to using steroids. 
But Verducci was hearing complaints from clean players nearly every time he took a reporting trip. He told his editors he wanted to expose the growing divide in clubhouses. I said, the biggest story in baseball right now is this kind of open secret about steroid use in the game and how it's changing the game. And somebody's going to write the story, and it better be us. Verducci had been writing about baseball since the 80s. He had a huge Rolodex, so he started making calls and working connections. On his list was Ken Caminiti, a former MVP who had just retired. Hey, there's a man that we know, Caminiti. Hits a home run and it sure looks pretty. Plays when he's hurt because the man is tough and gritty. Hey, Caminiti. Caminiti had been a fan favorite in San Diego, a fearsome slugger who helped lead the Padres to the World Series in 1998. And he was just in that circle of people I just wanted to touch base with. Hey, what do you know about this? So I didn't go in saying, hey, I think this guy's a steroid user. But Caminiti had also battled substance abuse throughout his career. And in 2002, when Verducci called, he was in treatment. Everybody knows you go through something like that. The first step is to really be honest with yourself. And so he was at that point in his life, as he said himself, he had nothing to hide. Caminiti said he might be able to help with the story. So Verducci booked a flight to visit him at his home in Houston. He's a guy who likes to work on classic cars and refurbished cars and So he's got a very big garage with lots of cars in it. And uh, we just pulled up two lawn chairs and sat across from one another and just talked for a long time. Almost as soon as they sat down, Caminiti came clean. He'd used steroids for several years at the end of his career. I could still hear him today saying, I have nothing to hide. I don't regret anything. Caminiti told Verducci everything. In 1996, when he tore his rotator cuff and couldn't lift his arm, he figured steroids might help him play through the injury. So he drove from his home in San Diego to Tijuana and bought some. Like many guys who use these drugs unsupervised, he took way more than he should have. Twice the recommended dose. Caminiti had always been a good player. He'd made one All-Star game, and in 95, he'd hit 26 home runs. Once he took steroids, though, his numbers got crazy. We love it. Oh, my gosh. In 96, he swatted 40 home runs and was a National League MVP. A three-run homer for Ken Caminiti. Caminiti again, get out of town, the center god, his second home run of the game. Break me off a little something, something, Ken Caminiti breaks off his 40th home run of the year. As he talked to Verducci, Caminiti made it clear that he didn't think of himself as an outlier. He was just one of many guys who was taking steroids and playing better than he ever had before. He never once mentioned the name of another player. Now, he did say in general he thought about half the players were using. Caminiti had no agenda. He wasn't a disgruntled player who felt as if others were getting an unfair advantage, and he wasn't trying to take down anyone else. He was just a retired star with a credible and detailed admission who had a lot to lose. And then later on, uh, after we talked for a few hours, actually, we went out to dinner together. And I remember during the dinner, he just kind of stopped and he said, this is going to be pretty big, huh? And I said, yeah, I think this is going to be a big story. And he said, that's okay. I'm perfectly fine with that. Maybe I'm naive. I I wasn't prepared for how big and what the reaction was and, you know, the the media appetite for the story. I remember going on a Today Show, like, the next day and just the calls never stopped. And the response to it, like, beyond just the sports world is what surprised me. I mean, it's kind of like the presidency before and after Watergate. Trust is broken and it never really gets fully repaired. We turn to sports to get away from the pressures of everyday living, your mortgage, your job, trying to raise a family, whatever it may be. So you don't want to be a cynical person when you're watching a sports game. Sports are supposed to be a break from reality. They're supposed to make you feel like 10-year-old me, wide-eyed and willing to believe in something. Baseball had spent years trying to keep the truth under wraps, and Caminiti's confession shattered the illusion. No one could doubt the story. They'd heard it from the player himself. They'd heard the gritty details of one man's use and the broad strokes of a league that had lost its way. It was the straight truth. And for once, fans listened. There was no messenger to blame, just a broken system. It was so simple. To bring down steroids, we just needed the players to talk, to think those of us on the outside had a right to the truth. Years after the Balco case had mostly wrapped up, 
Nowitzki found himself back in court with Barry Bonds. You see, Bonds had lied under oath about his steroid use during the initial investigation, back when he had immunity, back when all anyone wanted was a shred of honesty. So in 2011, four years after he retired, he went to trial for obstructing justice. I can tell you definitively, we were not excited about prosecuting Barry Bonds. We were like, ah, he forced our hand. This is going to be really difficult to bring a criminal prosecution against one of the most beloved athletes in the Bay Area. Bonds was found guilty and sentenced to 30 days of house arrest. But he did manage to get his conviction overturned four years later. By then, Jeff Nowitzki had moved on. After Balco, he turned his attention to Lance Armstrong. And he continued to feel like he was being targeted for taking down people's heroes. I mean, I still to this day look in my rearview mirror when I'm driving around and kind of have, you know, an eye behind me. Even as they were facing criminal charges, Mark Fanaruwada and Lance Williams won several awards for their reporting on steroids. President George W. Bush praised their work, and they turned their investigation into a book. And Ken Caminiti continued to battle addiction. He died in 2004 of an overdose on cocaine and heroin. He's remembered to this day for being the player who broke baseball's silence, who told his own story instead of waiting for someone else to dig it up. He's one of the few players who didn't lie. And the guys who became the faces of the steroid era, Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, they did lie over and over to protect their legacies. And maybe that did more damage than the drugs themselves. What if more players had followed Caminiti's lead? In 2005, lawmakers tried to force them to do just that. Next time on Crushed. Now, Mr. McGuire, would you like to comment on that? I didn't, I didn't get a definitive answer. I didn't hear you say anything about it. Well, sir, I'm not here to talk about the past. Crushed is written and reported by me, Joan Neeson. Jessica Popovac is our senior producer. Our associate producer is Devin Manzi. And our production assistant is Megan Coyle. Michael Garofalo is our editor. Jane Ackerman fact-checked the series. And Tommy Bazarian from PRX Productions mixed this episode. Gotham Chopra, Amit Sankaran, and Adam Schlossman are our executive producers. Special thanks to Lisa Pollock and to composer Michael Kramer. Crushed is a production of Religion of Sports and PRX. If you like the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you do your listening. On behalf of everyone on the Crush team and at Religion of Sports, we want to thank sponsors Odoo, Progressive, DraftKings, and BetterHelp Online Counseling for supporting the show and its creators during our launch.